Good evening, love. I am recording. Uh, these chapters are getting considerably longer. <coughs> that last one chapter took me at least ten minutes. So I'm going to read chapter ten and a little bit of chapter eleven today. Chapter ten. Look at the moon. Early the next morning, the prince set out to look for something to eat, which he soon found at a forester's hut, where for many following days he was supplied with all the brave prince could consider necessary. And having plenty to keep him alive for the present, he would not think of once, not yet in existence. Whenever care intruded, this prince always bowed him out of the most princely manner. When he returned from his breakfast to his watch cave, he saw the princess already floating about in the lake, attended by the king and queen, whom he knew by their gowns, in a great company and lovely little boats, with canopies of all colors of the rainbow, and flags and streamers of great many more. It was a very bright day, and soon the prince burned, burned up with the heat, and began to long for the cold water and the cool princess. <laughs> but he had to endure till twilight, for the boats had provisions on board, and it was not till the sun went down that the gay party began to vanish. Boat after boat drew away to the shore, following that of the king and queen, till only one, apparently the princess's own boat, remained. But she did not want to go home even yet, and the prince thought he saw her order the boat away to the shore without her. At all events, it it rode away, and now, of all the radiant company, only one white speck remained. Then the prince began to sing, and this is what he sung. Lady fair, swan white, lift thine eyes, banish night, by the night of thine eyes. Snowy arms, oars of snow, o'er her hither, flashing low, soft and slow, o'er her hither. Stream behind her, o'er the lake, radiant whiteness in her wake. Following, following, for her sake, radiant whiteness. Cling about her waters blue, part not from her, but renew, cold and true, kisses around her. Lap me round, water sad, that I have left her, make me glad, for ye had kissed her ere ye left her. Before he had finished his song, the princess was just under the place where he sat, and looking up to find him, her ears had tr led her truly, her ears had led her truly. Would you like a fall, princess, said the prince, looking down. Ah, there you are. Yes, if you please, prince, said the princess, looking up. How do you know I am a prince, princess, said the prince. Because you are a very nice young man, prince, said the princess. Come fetch me then, princess. Fetch me, prince. The prince took off his scarf and his sword belt and his tunic and tied them to all together and let them down. But the line was far too short. He unwound his turban and added it to the rest. When it was all but long enough and his purse completed it, the princess just managed to lay hold of the knot of money, and was beside him in a moment. Okay. This rock was much higher than the other, and the splash and the dive were tremendous. The princess was in ecstasies of delight, and the swim was delicious. <laughs> night after night they met and swam about in the dark, clear lake, where such was the prince's gladness that, whenever the princess looked, when, where such was the prince's gladness that. Whether the princess's way of looking at things infected him, or he was actually getting light-headed, he often fancied that he was swimming in the sky instead of the lake. But when he talked about being in heaven, the princess laughed at him dreadfully. And there's a prince, a princess, a picture comes with this. I don't know how well you can see these. Feel free to let me know. When the moon came, she brought them fresh pleasure. Everything looked strange and new in her light, with an old, withered, yet unfading newness. When the moon was nearly full, one of their great delights was to dive deep in the water, and then, turning around, look up through it at the great blot of light close around them, shimmering and trembling and wavering, spreading and contracting, seeming to melt away, and again grow solid. Then they would shoot up through the blot, and lo, there was the moon far off, clear and steady and cold, and very lovely, at the bottom of a deeper and bluer lake than there, as the princess said. The prince soon found out what, found out that while in the water the princess was very like other people, and besides this she was not so forward in her questions of pert and her replies at sea as on shore. Neither did she laugh so much, and when she did laugh it was more gently. She seemed altogether more modest and maidenly in the water than out of it. But when the prince, who had really fallen in love when he fell in the lake, began to talk about love, she always turned her head towards him and laughed. After a while she began to look puzzled as if she were trying to understand what he meant, but could not, revealing a notion that he meant something. But as soon... <laughs> oh. 
But as soon as ever she had left the lake, she was so altered that the prince said to himself, If I marry her, I see no help for it. We must turn merman and mermaid and go out to sea at once. Chapter 11 Yes! The princess's pleasure in the lake had grown a passion, but she could scarcely bear to be out of it for an hour. Imagine then her consternation when, diving with the princess one night, a sudden suspicion seized her that the lake was not so deep as it used to be. The prince could not imagine what had happened. She shot to the surface, and without a word swam at full speed towards the higher side of the lake. He followed, begging to know if she was ill or what was the matter. She never turned her head or took the smallest note of his question. Arriving at the shore, she coasted the rocks with a minute inspection, but she was not able to come to a conclusion yet, for the moon was very small, and so she could not see well. She turned therefore and swam home without saying a word to explain her conduct to the prince, of whose presence she seemed no longer conscious. He withdrew to his cave in great perplexity and distress. Next day she made many observations which, alas, strengthened her fears. She saw that the banks were too dry, and the grass on the shore and the trailing plants on the rocks were all withering away. She caused marks to be made along the borders and examined them day after day and in all directions of the wind, till at last the horrible idea became a certain fact. The surface of the lake was slowly sinking. The poor princess nearly went out of the little mind she had. She was awful to her to see the lake, which she loved more than any living thing, lie dying before her eyes. It slank away, slowly vanishing. The tops of rocks that had never been until now began to appear far down in the clear water, but before long they were dry in the sun. It was fearful to think the mud would soon lie where baking and festering, full of lovely creatures dying and ugly creatures coming to life, like the unmaking of the world. And how hot the sun would be without any lake! She would not bear to swim in it any more, and began to pine away. Her life seemed bound up with it, and ever as the lake sank she pined. People said she would not live an hour after the lake was gone. But she never cried. I love you, Christy. I'll talk to you soon. And I'll be home soon, sooner. Sleep when I'm vegan light. I love you.